So once the, uh, the, the child comes out, it comes into the next stage of dunya. So dunya has five stages. The first stage is one through, he says five, and there's another one that goes with seven, which is consistent with the Western tradition. You could either go one to seven or one to 15. If you go one to seven, which is also considered a classical Islamic uh, category. During these first seven years, it's the responsibility of the parents to nurture the child. This is a p time that there is absolutely no responsibility, none. It's prohibited to, uh, to have any physical discipline during this time. Even up till 10, physical discipline is, is not permitted. Uh, in, 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 uh, in Sharia uh, other than uh, the scholars say like twisting the ear right um, grabbing the stomach you know pinching the stomach giving them pinches any type of physical violent force is prohibited uh, in any situation whether it's male adult female adult or child is prohibited for any uh, violent physical abuse that is haram in Sharia Absolutely. And there's no proof or justification for it. And we'll, we're going to look at the verse that a lot of people misunderstand, including, unfortunately, uh, some Muslims um, about that. But it's, it's well known in the uh, Islamic uh, Sharia that it is prohibited uh, to physically uh, strike uh, anyone with violence. Mm -hmm. Um, I just a question about the embryology. Was that from the Quran or the Hadith? No, that's Quran. That's Quran. Yeah, it's uh, there's several verses that deal with that actually, but the one I gave you was twenty two five. Now in twenty two five uh, it continues and it says, "Afterward we bring you forth as infants." The word in Arabic, this stage is called the tifl. Now tifl means in Arabic, tufayli is a parasite. The tifl is somebody that cannot live on its own. It, it needs a host. So the child needs the parents. And this is the responsibility of the parents to nurture the child. Now, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that every child is born on fitrah. And this is an important concept in Islam. Fitrah is the inherent nature of the human being. It's his aboriginal nature. It is believed in Islam that human beings are good in their nature. And it is, it is diseased societies that will uh, affect the, 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 the nature in a, in a diseased way. Now, this obviously does, is not congruous with the traditional Christian belief of the corrupt nature. But there is a similarity between the Islamic and the Christian belief in that there is a hadith that says that every child is born with a black seed in the heart. And this is similar, but not the same as, as the understanding of original sin. How would you describe the, let's call it crack day, is not Yeah, this is going to be uh, the Chil the actions of the parents affect their children. And there are, like in the Bible, the idea of visiting on seven generations, which is, you know, it's a lot. You're dealing with 64 parents. Uh, there is that concept in Islam, that your actions do affect your offspring. But there is no accountability of the offspring. In other words, nobody bears the burden of, you do not, like in some of the Chinese traditions, you have the idea of inherited curses. You know, that a family gets cursed for doing wrong, 
in one generation and their offspring will suffer the fate of that curse. But there is a belief in Islam that, you, that righteousness will affect your offspring and also wrongs will affect your offspring. You don't, you don't think that it has anything to bear upon the, the concept of, of uh, inherent nature because a crank baby in a sense is a, starts all with a, an addiction. An addiction. Right. And the mother is responsible for that, not the baby. So the mother has, has affected the, and that's, we have that ability to completely destroy the fitrah. The, the parents can do that to the child. They can ruin it. I mean, that's what happens. Fitrah is not, you know, children will not be, uh, if, if they are nurtured properly, now there is a bad seed. There is a concept of bad seed in Islam. There's definitely a concept. In other words, there is a belief that there are shayateen al-ins, which are demonic uh, humans. And, and this results, uh, one, that demons will, will actually par partake in the insemination, that there's hadiths that indicate that people that are like in fornication, in, and it's interesting because Islam accepts marriage in every tradition. You know, even though it, it doesn't accept uh, the, the, the Buddhist as a people of the book, um, they, it, you know, they're accepted as a, uh, as a tradition in that they can pay the, the, the jizya tax, according to Imam Malik, but their, their, their books are not accepted as uh, revealed books. They're not rejected, but they're not accepted. It's not in the Articles of Faith, like the, the Bible and the, the Gospel. But Buddhist marriage is accepted. If, if two Buddhists become Muslim, their marriage is valid. They don't have to renew that marriage because marriage is believed to be a divine institution. That it was through revelation that marriage came about. So marriage in any tradition is accepted. And therefore, children that are born of legitimate marriage in any tradition, uh, those children have the protection of the, the sanctity of the, of the union. Children born out of wedlock do not have that protection. And there can be effects on the children because of that. And one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ said is beware the wrath of bastard children. Beware the wrath of bastard children. That if you do that to children, they will be angry. And their wrath will come back to you. And he said, if illegitimacy spreads amongst a people, then they are spreading the wrath of God amongst themselves. And the wrath is in the children. Because that was a right that you have deprived them of. They have a right to legitimacy. And if you do not give them that, you have oppressed them. And oppression engenders anger. And they are often, they don't know why they're angry. Right? They don't know why they're angry, but they're angry. And, and for our country, when you're looking at 70% illegitimacy rates amongst uh, certain communities, right? and, and the dominant community, it's, it's, it's in the 40 percentile range. Right? That, which a lot of you grew up in an age where, you know, Girls disappeared in high school, right? I mean, it's really amazing how much has changed in, in, in our generation, right? I mean, in, in 1968, a woman was kicked out of Vassar for living with a man in an apartment. 68. And it's, it's really interesting how, how that's happened in this culture. So this fitra nature is this inherent nature and it is that the potential for good and evil exists, but the inclination is to, to good if it's nurtured. But the seed of evil can be nurtured also. And if that's done, then you get people that, that will, they're inclined to doing bad stuff, not good stuff. Mm-hmm. 
And shall I read it then and say in a Muslim country, are parents responsible for misdeeds of children? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there is no responsibility until puberty of the child. It all falls on the parents. After puberty, according to the hadith, the parents are taken to account in the next life, but not in this life. Once the child, you know, like if you've got chil uh, children that were raised brutalized, right, by their father, you know, or a crack cocaine mother who doesn't do anything for her child, these type things. The responsibility, this is why you can't judge people in this world in any absolute sense. The Prophet said, I was commanded to judge outwardly, but not inwardly. We, we do not have the authority to make inward judgments against people. We can only judge outwardly. And those outward judgments in Sharia ah are related to transgressions. But you cannot condemn people to hell. You can't, none of that. That's all inward judgment, and we have no authority in that realm. The variables that are involved in any human action are so vast that no individual can grasp them. We can't. But responsibility is, lies on the adult. Once you reach adulthood, you are responsible. And in Sharia, it's not going to hold up in court to have a psychologist in there explaining what happened when they were children and why they're doing that. That does not hold up in, in, in Sharia court. Although, Sharia laws are often uh, contextualized in that a Qadi might not decide to implement a, a had punishment, one of the, the penal punishments, because of contextual circumstances. That, that does exist. So there is that realm. It's, it's very uh, organic, the Islamic legal system. It's, it's not black and white at all. May I ask a question? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the ages between 7 and 15, which is a huge uh, difference. Uh, do some communities or traditions do the 1 to 7 and the other 1 to 15? I'm looking at all of, you know, a lot of the crime is being committed by pre-15. Yeah, that's that in, in Sharia, if they're adult, they're responsible. Although, uh, this culture by, by Islam, you cannot apply Islamic law in the United States. You can't. It would be completely unacceptable. Because Islamic law is organic. It's, it's, a, it's a holistic uh, system. You cannot have, so, like, let's chop off the hands of, uh, of thieves, and you have a consumer culture uh, where, where the whole society is, 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 is locked in to the, uh, the system of creating consumption as an addiction, right? I mean, you have to change. It's, it's you know, the, the Islamic uh, legal system, the first chapter of Islamic law books is called the chapter of purity. I mean, it, it, it's a spiritual tradition before it's a legal tradition. And so you can't, cannot impose the legal laws on a materialistic society. You have to introduce, and this is why the Meccan stage precedes the Medinan stage. The Meccan stage had no legal rulings. It was a stage of changing the perceptions of the people. And once that shift took place, this radical paradigm shift. Once that took place, then the rules begin to make sense. But to apply the rules without that would be injustice. Which is what, you know, this is the kind of conservative approach. Let's just make harsher laws. Right? See, the problem is the laws aren't harsh enough. Well, <laughs> you know, why are people doing what they're doing? And why is it that our, uh, our prisons you know, are over 60%, uh, in fact, in most places, it's more like 75, 80% minority? You know, why is that? Well, that's 
more evidence, you know, that these are inferior type people. I mean, there's a lot of, that's an unspoken uh, belief amongst a lot of people in this country. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people that are politically correct in their uh, public discourse, not in their private discourse. There's a lot of people that say, well, you know, these people, you know, they're different from us. They have different values, whatever, or no values. So whereas the Islamic situation is saying, look, what's going on, right? That th th these situations are being produced. What's engendering this? Because this is alien. You see, if you go to a black African, if you go to a Gambian village <laughs> where there's no crime, right? I mean, it's true or not true. And isn't it a large percentage of the African Americans in this country are from Senegambia, right? This, this is their genetic uh, inheritance. So why is it that a Gambian African uh, in his village is not uh, stealing, raping, and pillaging, right? And their 12-year-olds aren't going around doing gang banging. And yet, the same genetic bank in, uh, in the inner cities of, uh, of New York or, uh, right, or Chicago are doing that. You see, what's going on? Well, from the Islamic perspective, you have a diseased society. And therefore, you have symptomatic pathology. And the pathology is manifesting in children that are being raised in a disease-engendering culture. So during these seven years, it's not encouraged to teach children either because they're learning. They have their own learning schedule. And in traditional cultures, you did not begin to train children until they reached seven, which is consistent also with the, um, the Waldorf, right? Rudolf Steiner felt back in the 20s that if we begin to educate children at the age of five, we are going to see precocious sexual development occurring. And the reason he said that is, is because you're dealing with a divine programming that's designed at, at if, you, if you bring programming that's not meant to be introduced earlier, then you're going to pull the whole process down. So instead of the sexual maturation occurring, like in this culture, when people who here might have grown up in the 50s, uh, at the age of 14, most boys and girls were not thinking about sexual experimentation, right? Really, they weren't. And you can talk to your parents if you're not that old, <laughs> right? I mean, this is not, I'm not making this up. This is, even the menarche has, you know, uh, the, 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 uh, the period now, it, we have early onset periods. We've got girls now at seven and eight that are beginning to menstruate in, in certain areas. Right? So something's going on, right? Now, if you introduce, uh, it's actually considered damaging. Now, this is not true of all children. There will be because there, you're going to have children that want to read at the age of three or four. But the vast majority of children are not going to be like that. And so they're doing their work between one and seven. They know exactly what they're supposed to be doing, and you let them do that. They're developing their, their minds and, and they're actually, they are, according to Islam and according to a lot of our neurological research, uh, it's confirming these ancient beliefs. Because this is not just Islam. This, this, this is congruous with many traditions. Seven was an age of initiation in many, many traditions. And in the uh, classical European oral culture before uh, Christianity literized that area, uh, seven was actually, you were an adult at seven. You went from childhood to adulthood at the age of seven because in oral cultures, seven-year-olds speak like adults. And you'll notice a radical change in the, uh, the ability of a, of a child to articulate at about the age of seven and eight. There, there's a real change in their ability to express themselves. And this is why even in England, uh, you know, in the 8th, 9th century, uh, 7-year-olds and 8-year-olds were being hung 
for uh, horse theft, right? Which, I mean, obviously that's uh, horrific, but it's indicative of an oral culture and how they view. And this is why you will find marriage occurred in oral cultures at early ages also. Uh, it was not uncommon in, in Europe, uh, Asia, the Middle East, Africa, for an eight or a nine-year-old girl to be married. Not uncommon at all, because they were considered to have already reached uh, the age of maturation in the oral understanding. 